Uh, let's get to today's topic, which is Stoicism and marriage. We have as uh, guests uh, two people who are both Stoic practitioners and in fact married to each other. And so this is going to be an interesting conversation. Um, we have <laughs> Andy Shaka, who is an associate professor of humanities at the Milwaukee Institute of Art and Design the CEO of Women's Entrepreneurship Week and an associate for accreditation and licensing for the European Graduate School, where she is also a doctoral candidate in philosophy. Andy serves in leadership positions for several nonprofit organizations and enjoys mentoring emerging leaders in food system innovation and sustainability efforts. Greg, Greg Sadler is a philosopher who brings that discipline to practical, professional, and public settings. He's editor of Stoicism Today, producer and co-host of the Wisdom for Life radio show and founder of the Half Hour Eagle Project. He teaches at the Milwaukee Institute of Art and Design and is the president of Reason IO, a company putting philosophy into practice. And he is the first returning guest of this oh. show. <laughs> <laughs> I believe in fact Rob wasn't even on board uh, when the first time that Greg was uh, was around. That's that, right. That that's right? right. Yeah. So that time, I think we, we talked about um, common misunderstandings of stoicism. And yeah. uh, today we're going to talk about marriage. Welcome, Andy and Greg. <laughs> Thank you. It's great Thanks to be here. here. Yeah, I, I think we probably will also talk about some misunderstandings of stoicism. <laughs> uh, and this probably. <laughs> so. I think that's probably. right. So let me start with an obviously easy and and um, uh, yet I think interesting question, which is how is it that the two of you got into stoicism in the first place, and how did you get married? Well, I'll start. Few, I'll, start. <laughs> yeah. I'll start, and then and then Greg can, sure, can add. Sure. I think um, because for me, Greg is the reason that I am involved in stoicism. Um, I we went to high school together and there's a whole long story there that I'm sure Greg will, will give pieces and bits. Um, but when we met or re-met or reconnected, uh, Greg was living in North Carolina. I was in New York. Um, he moved up to where I was, um, in the Hudson Valley and we ended up in this very tiny space, two big people <laughs> with two big dogs and two cats and these 7,000 books um, and I was living like on a hippie farm above a garage in a carriage house apartment. And I didn't enjoy my job very much at the time, but it was, you know, the better kind of paying of the two. And, you know, we had some long conversations about what it meant for our relationship long-term and, and our decision to get married. But um, I was under extreme duress, I think we could say, and a lot of stress. And because of where we were in the country, it would be you know, the, the place I worked was actually directly across from where we lived in Kingston, uh, across the river. And yet there were only two bridges on either side. And so I would have to drive 45 minutes down to get the bridge and then another 45 minutes back up to get to my workplace. And, wow. you know, it was a grueling assignment. Um, I mistakenly thought that, you know, the, the kind of advancement into administration as a dean when I had been teaching was the right thing to do and discovered that my worst day teaching is still better than my best day doing anything else. <laughs> and you could not pay me enough to be a Dean. Um, but I discovered that too late <laughs> after I'd already accepted the position. So um, there was an upcoming course of the stoic mindfulness and resilience training and stoic week and all these things. And, you know, and Greg said, Hey, listen, I think we should do this. I think it would help. I think there's a lot that you could take away. Um, I've said before that I always thought that the thing I needed to do was learn how to control the sun and then my life would be so much better. Um, and what I realized through stoic practice is that actually that's not the case for me at all. I do not get, you know, I, I, I'm not served well by my past controlling tendencies, which I'm sure Greg and I can both agree are past only in so much as they're, they're not on display right now. You know, I mean, it's a constant, constant process, but um, yeah, I have found it changed my life positively in ways that I never could have anticipated and definitely has had positive impact on our relationship, on our marriage, on my relationship with others. Um, but that's my story. And then in terms of, you know, kind of how we got together and got married and decided to continue doing this sort of practice together, I'll let actually Greg speak to that. Right. Yes. So there's a, yeah, a lot of different moving parts to that. I'll say that, um, I ended up 
getting into stoicism in a serious way as opposed to like having encountered it and tried a little bit of it and then you know uh abandoned it quickly enough which which happened when i was an undergraduate you know and had to read some marcus aurelius and some epictetus right. and really like the toughness part the lowercase s stoic and, and ignored all the stuff about virtue and, yeah. <laughs> you know all the really important yeah. things um it was through uh looking to ancient philosophy for resources having to do with anger management which was an area that i, I started doing a lot of research in in graduate school and I, I still do today and i i was motivated first to look at you know aristotle and plato and and some of the later platonists and then i started to see how much there was in stoicism in terms of resources in Epictetus and Seneca and to a, to a lesser degree in, in, in Marcus, just because we don't have that much of his, his stuff. And that sucked me in to taking um, the philosophy seriously. And then I started, you know, doing more and more writing on it. And then I became, I think around the same time as Massimo involved in the, at that time, it wasn't actually called the modern stoicism organization because there wasn't an, organization i think it was just called stoicism today mm -hmm. and then you know when I, one of the things that's kind of cool about this both with the modern stoicism organization and with my my relation with andy is when you're when you're doing this stuff and you're not doing it by yourself but in conversation with other people you learn a lot yeah. more mm -hmm. and you can bounce ideas off of each other and so you know, both with, with, you know, Massimo and all, all the other people, Chris Gill, who was, you know, it's kind of like getting to meet a rock star. Uh, if you're an academic researcher and ancient philosophy, you know, Donald Robertson, all these other people we could mention, we, we, you know, bounce ideas off of each other and learn from each other. And then with, with Andy and I, um, we were doing something quite, quite similar. And so I think that my development in stoicism has been greatly aided by engaging with other people uh, you know the other stuff i'll say about the marriage thing so we actually got married on the way to work and um it was uh it was supposed to be a very matter of fact kind of thing a little bit of backstory you know when when uh states like new york passed um legislation that allowed for domestic partnerships we did that and we did that so I could have insurance and, you know, just in case I got sick because Andy had insurance yep. and, and I didn't. And then the government came along and said, well, that's taxable. And so very being very practical people, we were like, well, I guess we better get married. I mean, we were going to get married anyway because we'd yep. fallen in love and we'd moved in together and, and you know, we were beginning our, our whole life together. But we, we also did decide, well, it needs to happen soon. And so we, we had a, before the next tax, tax cycle. Exactly. It so, really was. And, and, and our 10 year anniversary is coming up oh, um, nice. very, very soon. Congratulations. And so we, we literally went to the township of Asopus and there's a marriage officer there and, and she did this ceremony. And, and uh, then we went on our way to work. I was teaching at Marist college at the time and Andy was working <laughs> at the culinary and um you know, it's, it's kind of, I think a lot of people get into weddings and they do a lot of big production kind of stuff. Um, in, in a way, it might be better to make it very short and matter of fact, because ne neither way do you really know what you're getting into at the start, <laughs> right? right? You <laughs> have right. to, you have to grow with it. And, and it I is think, an unknown anyway. The, the yep. one thing I'll, I'll end on, because I don't want to take up too much time, is if you really do a lot of like planning and ceremony and stuff like that, the emphasis tends to be on that that day and that that time as if that's going to set everything on the right path yeah. afterwards and and instead marriage is continually it really does require the stoic virtue of courage which a major portion of which is perseverance right and, and perseverance is making the right decisions or unmaking your wrong decisions over yeah. and over and over again right, that's right. so that's right. um yeah that's a good it, way to put it yeah absolutely yeah like that rob i think you have the yeah and i i just wanted to um you know as long as we're talking about this a little bit my wife and i uh this next year are going to be celebrating our 30th anniversary oh wow congratulations oh, nice. um and uh you know so some of the questions i'm going to ask are kind of inspired by that um <laughs> <laughs> um 
But I also wanted to bring it back to sort of some of the sort of specifically stoic ideas and some of the texts and places where I get pushback from people who I mm. talk to and stuff. Um, but first, one of, the, one of the things that comes up with a lot of related topics to relationships and stuff like that is, is there a difference, and if so, what, between the way, say, the Greek Stoics talked about relationships and marriage and the Roman Stoics, right? So people will point sometimes to, for example, the ideas of, uh, you know, women and children held in common in, in supposedly in Zeno's Republic. And then you get, say, Musonius Rufus's rather sort of um, almost Victorian sort of talk about sex and marriage and relationships. Yeah. And uh, I wondered if you had something to say about that, either of you guys. Well, um, I mean, Andy, is there anything you want to say before I... This is the only thing that I'll say is that I probably wouldn't add much value to the conversation in part because when I was asked the question about whether or not stoicism could be good for women, my answer was women are people and stoicism is good for people. So I don't understand the question. Um, so with that said, I think, you know, when it comes to scholarship, Greg is definitely the person to turn to. But I, I, I do think that as a woman who practices um, any kind of uh, sort of philosophical thought, I'm always kind of just placing myself into the text and positions that feed me rather than you know, starve me out of the conversation. Mm. Um, but with that said, Greg, I, I, yeah, why don't you take it from there? Yeah, so I think there's a couple things to say. I mean, one is we really have almost nothing of the early Greek Stoics or, or the middle Stoics on, on these matters, at least. And I don't know how much we can read into the, the remarks about the Republic. I mean, what we know is that Zeno and Cleanthes and Chrysippus wrote texts that are recorded in the titles of which are recorded in Diogenes Laertes that are very tantalizing for, you know, what they're, they're saying, because, you know, dialogues about love and stuff like that, but we have nothing from that. So it's, it's, it's hard to say what the contrast is. And, and the irony too, is that a lot of our Roman Stoics are actually writing in Greek, you know, uh, Epictetus, Masonius, um, Marcus. Um, and, and we, you know, we, we do know a good bit about Stoic ethics um, from Seneca and also from Cicero writing in Latin. On the topic of um, marriage, Musonius, yeah, he has some things to say. And it's interesting because a lot of people who want to use Musonius because they're cultural <clears throat> conservatives, they will focus in on, uh, you know, marriage is for procreation, right? And then immediately after that, he starts spelling out this marriage is a friendship and um I, I, he doesn't, of course, use a word like intimacy because there isn't there isn't a word for that. But I think that Musonius actually fits into this um, this uh, current that we see in ancient philosophy, and I, I don't want to say that it didn't exist among the Hellenistic Greeks, but it's definitely there in uh, Roman times where marriage comes to be considered as something that in the middle ages will get, you know, brought out even more by these, these monks who are reading Cicero and Seneca and, and um, uh, you know, authors like that, where a marriage is supposed to exist for multiple reasons. There's, there's the pleasure that spouses can take in each other. And that can be through um, how they, you know, use their sexuality, but it can be a whole bunch of other things too. And, you know, a marriage that's formed on that basis from a Stoic perspective is probably on, on thin ice. Making kids, that's nice. Uh, a lot of marriages don't produce kids, you know, um, so that can't be the sole purpose. But the friendship that love, eros or, or philia, produces, that's something considered really valuable. And, you know, it becomes what 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 gets called in the Middle Ages conjugal love, and I think that Musonius kind of fits into that tradition, and I think Stoicism should emphasize that in in the present, and it doesn't have to be just marriages. We can think of other committed partnered relationships um, along similar lines. So I don't know if that fully answers. So, Greg, I, I want to pick your your, your brain about this. Um, then spe specifically staying on Musonius for a, for a moment. Yeah, yeah. Right, because Musonius is, uh, as you say, it, it, it can be 
interpret it in a very sort of modern conservative yeah. fashion or in almost a feminist fashion. I mean, after all, it does right. explicitly say women have the same ability as, as men. Uh, they should learn, you know, uh, virtue because what human being, you know, going back to Andy's comment about women, men, and human beings in general, what human being cannot possibly, uh, you know, be, uh, you know, improved by, by practice in virtue. Yeah. Uh, not only that, but he, he actually chastises uh, men and says, you know, you want your women to be uh, chaste and, uh, and all that and, and, and reserved, but you guys go around and do whatever the hell you want. It's like, yeah, how does that work? So, yeah. so there's a lot of modern uh, or, or modern sounding, at least uh, language in there. But then there is also the thing about, yeah, sex is, only within marriage and, and for procreation, which Epictetus also repeats. Yeah. Um, so there was a, a paper that I read a f- two or three years ago. Uh, in this was a technical paper, and I, have, I will have to look up the the authors, but um, about uh, stoicism and and feminism. So in ge- in general, and the interesting idea I thought that the the authors presented was like, okay, we can go there and and analyze and reanalyze what Seneca, Musonius, and all that sort of people write specifically about that may or may not sound feminist from a modern perspective. But the bottom yeah. line is that the really important question is whether Stoicism as a philosophy, regardless of what any particular Stoic had actually written, entails or doesn't entail something like uh, feminism. Feminism here understood oh. very simply. Yeah, feminism yeah, yeah. simply understood as you know, the notion, the radical notion, as sometimes is put, that women and men are, you know, both human beings, and therefore they, they deserve the same rights and, and privileges, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. If you understand feminism minim, in a minimalist way, that in, in that way, then the question is, well, Seneca may or may not qualify, Mozanus may or may not qualify, but then again, they are, it's difficult to tell apart their own cultural milieu and time and place from the philosophy. But the philosophy yeah. itself, one could argue that does or is, is or is not friendly to certain certain notions. So just off the cuff, uh, off the cuff, uh, uh, what do you think? If, if I say stoicism and feminism, what, what comes to mind? Both, both of you, Andy, feel free to jump in any time. Do you want to take that one, Andy? Or right I think I'll respond because I'd love to hear what you say. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. As your pal, as your wife. No, I'm just kidding. Um, yeah, I I would love to hear what you say though, but yeah, I'll respond on that one because I we both know that I have strong feelings about it. So oh, you want to hear what I say first. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, I think I think yeah, because that way she can, you know, criticize you for what it is that you're about to say. No. <laughs> so I'll I'll say I'll say two things. One is that um I think what you're saying, Massimo, is, is completely right, that if we understand feminism in terms of what's often called equality feminism, often associated with like first and second wave thinkers like, you know, Mary Wollstonecraft, great virtue ethicist, right? Um, and also a great exemplar of, of, of the virtues, more or less, her, herself. Um, I think stoicism is very congenial to that. And it, it in our current context, it would be, promoting it just as we, you know, if you're, if you're a Stoic, um, I think that if you really take the, the philosophy seriously, you, you know, you can't be a racist. Um, if you are, if you find racist tendencies within yourself, Stoicism would tell you need to root those out. One, one thing I'll point out too, that one of the examples of the indifference for the classic Stoics is the color of a person's skin, mm-hmm. you know, so that, that should be, uh, useful for that the the other thing i'll say is um and i think this is something that that andy will probably go off of as well the things that stoicism has to say about um marriage or about gender and sexuality or about about any of these things um it's it's not as if there's like a special stoic doctrine about this and then a special stoic doctrine about that there you know it's a general philosophy and it is a complex one. So it's not as if there's like two axioms that you work off of and everything falls into place, but um, you know, so like, let's think about this in terms of like gender roles within a marriage. Um, yes. Musonius is, is very 
progressive in our current sense, uh, but he still does think that men and women are, are somewhat different in, in the roles that they would inhabit within, you know, a household, but we don't have to be bound to that at all. You know, we can say, well, that is, that is a, just a, a manifestation of his cultural situation. Epictetus is, is a bit, well, not a bit, he's much more <laughs> about traditional gender roles. Guys need to have beards, for example. Um, and right. so philosophers uh, need a beer. That's right. So. Well, men, men, period, men ought period, to have a beer. Right. So Massimo, you're in trouble. But I know. I, I, just, okay. I just shaved recently. <laughs> uh, be before, um, uh, before we go on, I actually looked up the paper that I just mentioned uh, oh. is by Scott Eichen and Emily McGill Rutherford. <laughs> and it was published in a Symposium in 2014 with the title stoicism feminism and autonomy so if people are interested and want to look it up it's 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 really it's really well done because as i said the uh, the thesis that they put, put forth is like look if you look at individual ancient stoics they have a mixed record when it comes to yeah. women mm -hmm. uh you know they say some things that are way ahead of their time uh or, or or at least on par with things that epicurus was saying for instance because epicureanism also was uh you know friendly to women as a philosophy uh, but generally ahead of the time. And then other things are like, no, you, you, you cringe. To, to, you cringe to that. It's like, you know, especially when you keep reading Seneca and says, oh, don't be womanly. Don't be you yeah, know, this yeah. and that. It's like, no, that's obviously not acceptable. But they said the really interesting, important question is, does Stoicism as a philosophy have the tools for endorsing a robust version of feminism? And, and they agree with your, what, what you just said, that the, the answer is positive. Uh, and in particular, uh, that answer comes out of the notion that, well, the Stoics are cosmopolitan. That's and, true, too. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and, uh, and for the Stoics, anybody who is capable of reason uh, is, uh, ought to be treated with justice. And it seems to be knowledge. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I, I do want to hear what Andy has to say in response, but as sort of a tangent to this, do you think that uh, a commitment to cosmopolitanism means like looking across cultures and saying, well, here's where we can say that like gender roles really do vary from culture to culture to culture. And so we don't need to be beholden to Hellenistic Greek or, you know, traditional Roman or, you know, pick whatever else. Cosmopolitanism would mean not a sort of relativism, but, a, but at least a sort of recognition that many of these things are just culturally conditioned. Well, I, I mean, if I can follow up on that point, I've been thinking, I mean, how, I think this is a related question, right, is how much of this can we fully separate mm. from the cultural context in which they've come up, right? It, it's not as though, like, we can read Musonius and say, well, that's, this sentence is pure stoicism, this sentence is <laughs> cultural conditioning, yeah, right? Yeah. Nor can we do, right? So, so. I wonder if we can separate that in a way that's robust enough to ground the idea that there is a stoicism that entails, uh, you know, first or second wave feminism, for example, or, or something. Yeah. Don't I mean, you think, might... though, it's more about mapping it, mapping it on. I mean, I'm just listening to what Massimo said about, you know, whether or not there's a mixed record. I think there's a mixed record on most areas of yeah, philosophy. Quite. I mean, Greg talks about this, about what Aristotle would say, were he alive oh, now yeah. about his position on women. And I think that as a, as a woman who's operating in the world as a woman, you're constantly having to map on things. I mean, it's not like I'm reading Epictetus or I'm reading someone and I get to a point and I'm like, oh, I'm supposed to not do that. I better not. Like there's no prescriptive, prescriptive sense of myself in this writing or this reading or this reflecting. Mm -hmm. And, you know, between the two of us, and I hope Greg doesn't mind me saying this, but he is by far the more emotionally sensitive partner. And that doesn't make me a bad woman. We're not gender essentialists in our house. We look at the kind of pathways that we're on and figure out sort of, you know, where we might better support one another. And that's an ongoing process in any relationship, in particular in a marriage. Um, but, you know, when it comes to the kinds of like nurturing things, that's much more his camp than mine. And I've learned how to be more nurturing as, as a part of my relationship with him. Um, you know, I'm the one who was like, let's go to the marriage officer. Let's sign this thing. I went to an academic <laughs> affairs meeting after people were like, oh, didn't you want a wedding? And I said, no, I catered them. They're ridiculously expensive. And <laughs> why would I ever spend that money? We could put that into land. We could put that into books. We could put that into travel. Right. So 
I think that if you were to take a step back and say, oh, Andy's, you know, a woman, and yet she's so different in these ways, you would be prescribing to that very sense of restriction that we're trying to move away from. I'm a human. I use stoicism as a human. I'm married to someone who is engendered as a man. I'm engendered as a woman. That's also our biological sex. And we just kind of go about the business of our day. Now, it doesn't mean that there aren't things that I think are kind of in our marriage that maybe support certain traditional gender roles, but it's not because we feel assigned to them or limited by them. It's because we choose them for ourselves because we're thinking, feeling beings with autonomy. And I think that there's a a lot of conversation and it's important. And I don't mean to imply that it's not reflecting on the past and the thinkers and the history and the literature and, you know, all of these things about the placement of women. And as a woman who operates in the world right now as, as a person of agency, I would say, Yes. And how do we deal with that now? Right. Because how are we as Stoics or people who are practicing Stoicism or people who are just trying to be kinder to one another, to not be racist, to not be sexist, to not be jerks? How are we using tools from philosophical thought to strengthen our ability to be better human beings? That is always my orientation. Um, And I'm not suggesting that the conversation isn't important, but my question is, what if it's not? What if it's not there? Does that mean that we don't practice it? Do we have to find instances that we can point to? I don't think so, right? Um, but at the same time, I do understand, again, I'm not in any way suggesting that this isn't good to do, but as somebody who's often left out of the conversation, if I look at it historically, I don't care. I don't care that I'm left out of the historical conversation. My concern is how am I involved in the conversation of the present? How do I apply, you know, the various disciplines? How do I move away from bad habits or bad behaviors and learn from what's there for me uh, to use to do that? Whether or not someone was able to do that a thousand years ago is probably, um, you know, relevant only in so much as that I can say, I wish that that had not been the case, but I could apply that to numerous categories throughout history based on where we are and what period of history we're talking about. (laughs) <laughs> yeah um I, I think it's good i mean you're highlighting right um some really important things about how we read these ancient texts and and um what we take out of them and i think that's i think that's um important to reflect on as we do it um speaking so of which, uh, let me let me remind uh, the audience yeah. that um they can uh, uh, post <clears throat> questions in the chat and then at some right. point we might pick a couple Two or three, depending on how t- much time we have. Yeah, sorry, uh, Rob, go ahead. Yeah, right. Um, I wanted to ask you guys about um, about the text, right? Um, and in particular, about Enchiridion 3, which is the I'm fond of a jug passage, right? Uh, so, right, when Epictetus says, right, so, uh, you know, so I'm fond of a jug, right? If you remember that, and that jugs are the sort of things that break, uh, then when your jug breaks, you won't be upset about it. And then he immediately goes to, and then say that when you kiss your wife or your child, yeah. right, that they're a human being. Um, and he doesn't say this, right? But I, I think the obviously implication is that they're going to die and then you won't be upset, right? Or, or no, he does yeah. say that in the passage. And I always get, whenever I talk about that passage, I always get a ton of pushback about like how cold callous and uncaring is that right yeah that you know people want to throw away their books or whatever at this point and so i wondered what you guys had to say about that passage and how i I, yeah what what do you think you know when you kiss each other and and, and, then good night and night are you thinking (laughs) and you know i know you might not be here tomorrow morning but hey what the hell (laughs) well frankly we're such workaholics that when we hit the bed we're both exhausted and are not thinking of much of anything but i will say this i've i've had i i always got so much pushback that i actually wrote a piece a while back specifically about that passage and you know how to interpret it i think it's important that the fond being fond of there is philosturgia right mm-hmm. so it's the familial affection that you're supposed to feel towards towards people um and you know it can be children can be your spouse um it's not just like fondness, it's you love them. And so Epictetus is acknowledging that you do in fact love them. And I think that one of the ways in which people often get mixed up, and this is a larger topic about grief, is they think that if they don't feel 
terrible grief when somebody goes, then they didn't really love them. And the Stoics would say, no, those are not connected with each other at all. Um, you, ideally, if, if somebody dies, um, I mean, you could, especially if they're a child, you say, oh, there's way too young and this is unfortunate. Their, their life was snuffed out, but you don't have to see it as like the end of the world. Um, you know, I, I think that Epictetus is also isn't saying when your spouse dies, it's going to be just like a jug breaking. You know, that's not the implication of the passage. It, he is telling us there's like three, and I don't remember the exact Greek terms, but it's things that you're fond of, things you, I think you find useful. And then there's one other one that I'm trying to bring to mind. But so it's covering a wide range of, of stuff that we should have a different response to. But yeah, people find that pretty, pretty cold and callous. Um, it doesn't have to be interpreted that way. That yeah. It can be contextual. Don't you think that that also comes from, uh, to some extent at least, it, it is connected to Stoic metaphysics, uh, even though that's a bit of ethics, oh. right? Meaning, for instance, because because re let's remember that for the ancient Stoics, not necessarily for the modern ones, but yeah. for the ancient Stoics, the universe is uh, you know a living organism, and we're literally bits and pieces of it, yeah, and yeah. everything we do is in fact, uh, or, and everything that happens to us is for the good of the organism. When Epictetus uses the the famous analogy of the foot that yeah. has to cross the, the the muddy path, right? So if you see things that way, uh, then there is actually quite a bit of uh, solace that you can, you can take from, from that, from that view of, the, of providence in a, in a sense. This is not providence in the Christian sense yeah. of the term, but it's still a kind of providence. It's still like, well, I may not understand it, and it might hurt me, and it might, I might not like it, just like if I were a foot having to cross, you know, to step into the mud. But if I remember that this is all part of a whole, shebang that is going on and that the shebang itself is good uh then i actually should be you know should be happy about it not not even that's why he says peter is in more than one occasion he says that we shouldn't just embrace you know just accept it you should embrace it you should actually yeah. you know go with it i mean i think you can do that right i don't think that's in that passage no um, not in that passage right yeah um i thought you were going to go with like talking about like how marcus over and over and over again reminds himself listen things break down you know, mm -hmm. yes. you're going to break down <laughs> and, and, you know, going, going back to marriage. So it, there's, there's um, not just the fact that either Andy's going to die before me, or I'm going to die before her. Or we're going to die at the same time, um, which in some ways would be ideal because uh, you know, <laughs> then you don't have to like worry about anything <laughs> afterwards. Just over. <laughs> exactly. Um, but we also have to think about the the relationship itself is something that's continually in flux and probably, you know, a marriage is like any other relationship, like a strong friendship or a business partnership. It's something that you can't simply take for granted as remaining exactly the same. And so a stoic metaphysic point of view on it might actually be helpful in that respect because you're more attentive to the fact that um if you don't you know retune things every once in a while or anticipate you know andy's parents are still alive um that's part of why we moved back here to wisconsin other you know than the fact that we love it here and we're from here um and sooner you know they're probably there's a good chance they're gonna they're gonna die before her and then she is going to be in in considerable grief and i'm gonna have to be there to comfort her and help her out and um you know that's also part of the a, a relationship like that you know i think though too i mean to my, your... my my kids give her give give us some some grief as well so it's not just her parents <laughs> go ahead andy i think what we were saying though rob about that passage is you know that's the first time i actually encountered difficulty in what we were doing and discussing in our stoic fellowship because i really struggled with that and it, it was very early on in my understanding of kind of the larger picture but it was so helpful to work through it and to understand that it is not coldness. It is not any of those things. It is an awareness of, of time passing. And I look at someone like Catherine Coromillis, who's, you know, doing the Stoic death comp contemplation. She just did for Stoicon. She's going to do it again for Women's Entrepreneurship Week as a form of helping people think about, you know, how to frame their lives. But we had those two big dogs and they became senior dogs and we took such good care of them that they lived far beyond their breed's life expectancy. And so it was kind of like any day could be the day. Yeah. But I found myself channeling that and saying, 
you know, to them, like you've been such good dogs to me. And I, I, you know, I care for you. I mean, when they died, I was gutted. I was devastated. Those were my children. He had human children. I had these, these beasts, but I loved these beasts. And were it not for understanding that it was inevitable, I think that I would have treated their age and their aging process and their decline very differently. It became part of what was the natural course of things. And therefore I could process it continuously. It wasn't like one day I was surprised by their loss. And I talk mm. to people who kind of think in those terms, you know, that everything is fine until it's not. And I don't know that that's really emotionally very useful. Um, so I went from being very opposed to that, you know, kind of passage to actually embracing that passage as part of what has brought me great value when I'm with my parents, I'm thinking of the fact that I should notice certain things. Like I should notice, you know, my dad has these Italian plum trees and, you know, it's like his thing and it's been his thing since I was a kid and he was making jam just months ago. And I, I kind of watched it and, and paid special attention and said, this is part of the experience of my dad in this world. And, you know, this jam is part of who he is. And I was able to appreciate it differently, recognizing that there aren't so many summers where his jam will still be made. Mm -hmm. right. And it was beautiful, you know? So I, I, I do think that that's a tough thing with Greg <laughs> and me, you know, ideally we do die at the same time because that's, there's a lot there, <laughs> but that's any marriage, you know? And, and yet I do think Massimo, I do say, often now, much more often than in the beginning, this is a person, this is a human, this person brings me value, this person brings me comfort. I care about this person. I will miss this person when they're gone. I'll miss, you know, all of these things were I to be the one who, who was left uh, living after, after something would happen to Greg. And it changes the way that I appreciate him in the moment and in the present. And I think if that's a value that any kind of partner can take, whether it's a business partner or a marriage partner, that's a great thing to, you know, to see that person and understand that this is now, and you can only really have this now, now, you know? Yeah, that's great. I really, um, I like that. I find that passage actually quite comforting. Um, yeah. In surprising ways, right? Um, yeah. Uh, it really helps you appreciate those. Um, I wanted to follow up and then with one more um, and then maybe we can get to some of the questions from the audience. Um, uh, this question is actually sort of inspired by my wife. So uh, we'll see. Um, and it's about kind of the dichotomy of control, right? The idea that some things are up to us and some things aren't. And a lot of times in stoic context, people take, take advantage of this and say, look, you know, you can't upset me with because your opinion is up to you or your belief is up to you and mine is up to me. Right. Um, yeah. But given that marriage is typically filled with joint projects, mm -hmm. right? How is that sort of thinking compatible or not? Right? Isn't is is it compatible with the sort of shared project that marriage itself is, or even you know things like how do we run the household? Right? Who feeds the dogs? I've got two big dogs too, so I, I'm sympathetic to that. Right? Mm -hmm. And isn't that precisely the sort of thing in which the things that are technically not up to us, right? The opinions of others, for example, really do matter. And are they really indifferent? So I'd be interested in your take on that. Well, I, I think that there's a lot of indifference that we shouldn't be indifferent to. Um, and Epictetus says that in his chapter on, on indifference, uh, adiaphoria. Um, our uses of things, our crisis, the way that we deal with them, they may be out, strictly speaking, outside of our control, but he says we still have to be concerned with them. And I think when you're, this is, this is something where maybe the, the apparatus that we have from classical stoicism doesn't do enough to help us out, but I, I think we can think of our pro races as overlapping. Um, when, when we're in relationships and it could be a marriage or, or it could also be a very, uh, long friendship as well. I'm sorry, Greg, um, prohiresis, um, not well, everybody that's following us yeah, might be familiar some, with the term. Something central for, the, for Epictetus, uh, it means the faculty of choice, you know, the right. locus that we have when, when we talk about the dichotomy of control, 
the the faculty of choice sometimes it's also translated as moral purpose a somewhat misleading translation is will in some other translations because it does cover a lot of what we call the will but not not exactly all of it it's it's the thing it's the the place where we get to make choices where we actually can determine things and it works upon itself and and you know and again in a marriage we work upon each other um so if Andy, if it's very important for her that something happens and I'm like, well, that's out of my control, you know, uh, I don't have to be concerned with it at all. You know, I mean, I, I see Rob laughing there. He knows what that's going to, what, what that's going to entail, right? Uh, anybody who's in a relationship knows how, how good that works out. We, we have to be kind of responsive to each other's um, needs. And another thing too is stoicism, like any intentional way of life, that's, that's based in virtue ethics is about taking us as screwed up uh, people who aren't even sure how screwed up we are and using, you know, things like our, our capacity to choose to make ourselves cumulatively bit by bit less and less screwed up. It's not about like having a bunch of, you know, perfect rules for perfect behavior that we then follow. It's not about having a, a number of axioms. It's about like this continual process of, 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 unscrewing ourselves up and we can do that together um you know ideally if you have a partner who's um you know bought into that you can you can work on it together and and sometimes you know andy helps me out by saying hey man you're screwing up you know <laughs> you, you need to <laughs> you need to rethink this thing that you've said because uh this justification that you've given it's bs and, and <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what's going on with your mentality now my BS is within my, my, you know, uh, realm of control. Right. But sometimes it takes somebody else coming in from the outside saying, man, you're screwing up, uh, for me to be able to actualize that. I think too, though, that's a, a level of respect and trust that we've built over the years because that's I true. did <laughs> absolutely. Um, there were times where, you know, and, and I'm, I'm not proud of this by any means, but like Greg would come to me and say something about perhaps something I said or a way that I behaved that impacted him negatively. And I would say, well, that's your choice, right? <laughs> um, that, now that, that is a, a big thing. I think it can be, stoicism can be abusive yeah. when we impose it on other people and we're like, oh, I, I don't have any control over your feelings. I may have insulted you and like thrown, thrown your stuff out or, you know, <laughs> ruined your plans, but I don't control your feelings. I mean, we have to recognize that we have responsibility. Go, yeah. go ahead. Andy. Sorry. To well, I think that's off. the thing. No, it's okay. I mean, that, that that's precisely the kind of thing that is, is, you know, evidence of, of the hard work it takes to be in partnership. Um, because I can recognize now that that was a move. It was, it was an area where I was trying to control the situation by saying something that I thought would, you know, distance me from responsibility. And, you know, there are so many things I think that I've learned about myself and the way that I was brought up to operate and the way that I chose to operate in the world that have benefited from this kind of study and this kind of engagement. But, you know, I, I'm actually at a point now where I wouldn't have imagined that I could be before, where Greg can do the, the same thing and bring it to me and say, you're about to mess this up, you know, because here's how you're looking at it. And I might say something like, okay, thank you for that feedback. I'm going to think about that. Whereas Andy two years ago would have immediately like pedaled to the metal, gotten into a very defensive argument. Um, because as you can probably tell, we're both very strong personalities <laughs> and we both are in fields where we have a certain sense of intellectual authority. And it's something that we both really enjoy. Our relationship truly is of the mind of the spirit of the heart of the body. Like I have my perfect partner in Greg, but it's a lot of work and I'm a lot of work. I am no easy partner <laughs> and I know that, but we've been able to use what we've, you know, kind of gained from these types of conversations to build bridges where there were maybe gaps, but also to take down some walls. Cause I think both of us, you know, brought some, some resistance into our marriage. And in addition to building positive uh, kind of habits of behavior and patterns and even emotions toward one another, um, we've definitely removed things that were problematic to happiness or joy or to living in accordance with nature, you know? Yeah, but in, in this particular case that we're talking about the preferred indifference and whether mm -hmm. something is up to you or not up to you, uh, I, I agree with with you know pretty much everything you guys said in the last few minutes. However, I do wonder whether in this particular case, 
the problem isn't really mostly with language, the language of stoicism, in particular in the way in which certain terms are translated often in English. Because after all, the Stoics, when they, when they talk about something being indifferent, they don't mean that you shouldn't give a crap. They just yeah, mean yeah. that it doesn't affect you as a mortal person. And that is true. Uh, regardless of, you know, if, uh, if Andy uh, says something then, that Greg may or may not agree or not, whatever Andy says doesn't change, doesn't affect Greg's virtue. But that doesn't mean what that there he's therefore entitled to ignore it or to say, I don't give a crap about this, because that actually would affect his, his virtue. Yeah. If he's the kind mm -hmm. of person that says, I don't give a crap, that mm -hmm. actually is, that's not a virtuous response. So in some sense, when we say things like, you know, it's indifferent, we don't mean that we shouldn't care. We just mean that, well, whatever he or she thinks, this mm -hmm. isn't of, you know, this isn't undermining me as a person. And that actually thinking that way actually helps, uh, you know, say, don't take it so personally. It's like, you know, whatever it is that I've heard from the other person, it's not actually making me a, a, a worse person. So let's mm -hmm. see exactly what you said. The same things goes for the, or similar thing goes for the notion of being under your control, you know, up to you or not up to you. Yeah. Um, again, th that that the idea there is not that if something is not up to you, therefore you shouldn't care, you shouldn't give, you know, shouldn't try to do anything about it. It just means that there are a lot of things, the outcome of which you ultimately do not control, and right. you should be always prepared mentally to accept that in this particular case, let's say, you know, of course you want to talk to the other person, to your partner and see if you can come up with an agreement to a, you know, a middle ground or whatever. But you have to be prepared for the possibility that you can't in this particular mm -hmm. case. That it may be that this is one of those cases where he or she is going to keep you know, her position and there is not much else you can do. You should try, um, but you should also be prepared for the notion that you know, it may not work. And, and then you have to deal with the fact that it might not work. So yeah. it's, I think that's a lot, a lot of it in this case, in this particular case, I mean, I do think that there are actual problems with, you know, certain notions in stories, but I don't think this is one of them. I mean, this is mostly a matter of, of language and, and the way in which these terms are translated uh, a lot, a lot of the times. So, hmm. um, well, you know, and, yeah. and something else I think that we talked a lot about during um Stoicon, and I, I always like to stress a lot, is Stoicism is um, a whole set of concepts, whatever we want to call them. And they're like a constellation, you know. Um, you don't have a constellation when you only have a few stars. Um, or you do, if you have a constellation, it's a really mediocre, crappy one. Yes. <laughs> and so a lot of these ideas, they people take them as if they're absolutes, like the dichotomy of control. The dichotomy of control needs to be contextualized in relation to a whole bunch of other Stoic ideas. And it's, it's difficult to do that because it requires additional learning and, and, you know, but that's what the virtue of prudence is partly about, right? Being able to harmonize these, these different ideas together. And um, so I, I think Massimo, you're right. Terminology is a big problem. I mean, even Cicero back in, you know, exactly. he was like, ah, you Stoics, you know, you, you, you bring in all this extra language. It's not helpful, you know? Right. And then he'd also say, ah, the Aristotelians are saying the same thing as you, which, which I don't really buy, but yeah. Um, <laughs> But no, the, that's right. I don't buy it either. But it's interesting you brought brought up Cicero because that means that already two thousand years ago, right. the Stoics had a problem with, with yeah. well, language. And, <laughs> and of course, Cicero decided to invent new words to just yes. cover that, right? Well, so. right. <laughs> <laughs> right. He had he had other he had precedent though, and the Stoics were already doing it. So. Yeah, yeah. We are, we have only a few more minutes. Uh, uh, Rob, do you want to pick uh, one question? Yeah, I did want to pick, and I think this might be a nice one to finish on. And this one's from Alexander. Um, is marriage and being married part of living in agreement with nature? No, uh, if you're just saying being married per se. Because ah, you can have you can have a crappy marriage. You could, I mean, look at half of our marriages end in divorce. Um, people get into marriages for the, the wrong reasons. A good marriage is in accordance with nature, right? And the better the marriage is, the more in accordance with nature it is. Uh, in accordance with nature isn't like an on-off switch. It's, it's something more like a, uh, like a dimmer, you know? 
uh, except it's not dimming. It's making things brighter. <laughs> what, what do you want to say, Andy? I agree. I mean, I think, I think it can, some days are dim, right? Some days are hard <laughs> yeah. It's because we're living together. I never, I, I never wanted to be married. I, I didn't want any piece of it. Uh, but when Greg and I reconnected and fell in love, I, there was no question. It was as if this kind of force had come before, right? That that's, that was what our relationship was supposed to be. Um, but I agree a good marriage, definitely, but a, a marriage on false pretense, a marriage where you can't grow with the other person, where you can't practice kindness or, you know, um, share yourself is, is a terrible thing. It's so much worse than, you know, being alone because you've bound yeah. yourself to this person. Um, you know, and marriages do fail. I mean, Greg, Greg was married once before, and if his marriage hadn't failed, we wouldn't be married now. Um, and I'm, I'm glad that we're together and I can have heartache for his loss of that relationship too, as a person with compassion for him, you know, that jug broke, um, but it out of it, you know, came something good. I mean, his, yeah. he's got wonderful children. I never wanted children like things, things work the way they're, they're, um, able to work. If you bring, you know, if you bring yourself to an open space, and that's one thing that has, I think, allowed us to get through the dim spaces is that the honesty, even when we disagree, even when we're very angry with one another, even when we're not practicing the things that we should be practicing, um, there's no deception. And so I can trust that he understands that I'm telling him exactly what I think or feel. He doesn't have to like it, but I'm adding that. And I know he does the same. You know, so for me, yes, that's the kind of marriage that that is great to have. I wouldn't want anything less or else. You know, we, we have a, a, a few more minutes and I'd like to ask you a follow up question based on uh, one of the another one of the questions from the audience. This is from Terry in, in London. Uh, Terry says new discoveries are made about human and animal nature daily, for example, in evolutionary psychology and uh, different natures of males and females across animals. Is stoicism flexible enough to deal with such differences? And the reason I brought up this question is because we've been talking about according to nature and whatever, what that yeah, means. Yeah. And that's, that's a source of confusion for a lot of people because that, it, that, there goes another problem with language, right? Um, because often when I present the idea of according to nature, living according to nature, people say, oh, you mean that whatever it's natural, it's good. And I said, no. Yeah. Clearly, I don't, because that's a that's a that's a basic logical fallacy, and it's very easy to disprove. You know, there's all sorts of stuff that is natural, and it will kill you, uh, like certain kinds of mushrooms, for instance. So, no, <laughs> right. don't. That it doesn't mean that whatever it's natural is good. And that's, I think, Greg, is where you were going when you said, well, it's not marriage that it's natural. Also, because marriage doesn't exist in nature. Obviously, that's a hum that's clearly a human inv invention. Um, it's a good marriage that it's according to in, in agreement with nature because in agreement with nature, I take it for the Stoic means in agreement with reason and with human nature, with human progress. Right. Yeah. Right. So, um, so in that sense, then Terry's question becomes interesting. It's like, well, but so what if we discover things in, you know, evolutionary psychology, uh, neuroscience, etc., that the ancient Stoics didn't know? Uh, does that mean that we should be doing things? differently and still according to nature. It means that we should be widening our conception of what counts as natural. So, I mean, one, one immediate thing to think of is, you know, the Stoics approach to marriage and, and what we've been talking about here is very heteronormative. Um, you know, Andy's a woman, I'm, I'm, I'm a man. Um, I mean, we had that whole discussion about like, who's, who's more, you know, emotionally sensitive and all that, but, but, you know, gender wise, we're, we're sort of a traditional couple. So what about um, same sex couples or, you know, what about um, however we conceive of, of attraction and, and gender and sexuality? I think we can apply, we, we don't have to say, well, anything goes, you know, that would be ridiculous because um, there can be abusive relationships. So there can be, right. you know, very exploitative relationships or people can, people can be in same sex couples undergoing a similar sort of cultural pressure to like, you know, fit in and, and do that when, it, when it's not for them. Um, but I think we would have to say, all right, what's, what's actually happening 
within the scope of the relationship are as you put it are the people developing towards a fully realized human nature together Mm -hmm. you know and that might even include um you know uh marriages where there isn't any sex going on you know Mm -hmm. uh you know what the french used to call a mariage blanche you know um they're asexual people might want to get together and and have a lifelong partnership and it could have the same sort of depth to it as um any other one so i i think yeah i don't know i don't know that we have to like look at like what we know about other animals in order to get that i think we we can just say listen um stoicism is about being rational beings um what's the scope of rational beings you know Right. In fact, I wouldn't look at uh, at other animals because the Stoics are pretty explicit that yeah. uh, we're talking about human nature. Uh, you know, yeah, the yeah. nature of a lion is a different thing. Um, and what is good for a lion is not good for me necessarily and vice yeah. versa. Uh, I, so, I, I, would, yeah. I would hate to like have to like, you know, fight off my brothers in order to run the pack and stuff like yeah. that because i you know i like other i, I yeah. like other people so <laughs> exactly so yeah. what, what works for us doesn't necessarily work for for other species but i think the general notion is that uh human nature po- uh, imposes certain constraints <clears throat> on what may or may not work uh, right. So yeah. there's many different ways of having relationships with other people. There's many different ways of having marriages, as you were pointing out a minute ago. Uh, and then there are some ways that don't work and they don't work because, you know, nobody likes to be abused. It's, it's not right. It's not right. according right. to reason. It's not agreement with reason and with human nature to abuse somebody else because nobody likes to be abused. And so if, if that's the basis for your relationship, then that relationship is, is, in fact, not in agreement with nature, even though you may be married and have kids. Uh, you know, maybe in fact less in agreement with nature than a relationship between two people who are not married, don't have kids, and yet treat each other as adults, uh, you know, with reason and compassion and, and, and so forth, right? So. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, we have done it. Um, we, we got to the, to the end of the hour very quickly, as far as I'm, I'm concerned. It just uh, went flying by. So, um, Andy, uh, Greg, thanks so much for being with us uh, uh, tonight. Uh, this has been uh, enlightening and, uh, and interesting and, and all that. And uh, Greg, thanks for coming the second time. Uh, I'm sure this is not going to be the last one either, but, you know, one of these days we'll get you about something else. So so thank you very yeah, much. Thanks so much to both of you. I, I want to, it's been a great conversation. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for having us on. It's, but I really enjoyed this. Me too. Thank you very much. Great.